What do you get when you add off-road suspension, wheels, and tires to a 1999 Dodge Viper? You get a real-life Hot Wheels car. And today we're going to drive it for the first time since almost a year ago when I started disassembling it with power tools and a complete disregard for the opinions of these people. We've spent the last few weeks chopping up Dodge Viper parts and installing off-road accoutrements, but there are a few things left to do to get the car in driving condition instead of just towable condition. Mostly little things, but little things have a way of turning into big things, and big things have a way of getting half done or just flat out ignored in the run-up to the first drive. But we will not be doing that today. We'll be doing a little bit of that today. We'll start with an issue that's been neglected for several weeks now. I asked you all to remind me to fix this on Instagram. About a thousand of you did, so I appreciate that. Since I lowered the transmission to get the output to line up with the new rear axle, I had a few issues, like the intake hoses don't reach the airbox anymore, which is a thing we're not going to fix today. Those parts are in the mail, but we are going to ignore it for now. We are, however, going to fix the hole in the frame. One of the exhaust tubes was touching the frame. I fixed this by shoving a sawzall up from the bottom and cutting out a chunk of metal. But now there's a hole in the frame, and also I didn't really fix this since the hole needs to be bigger. I don't really want to remove the headers, but that is the only way to do this correctly. But to do that, I need to remove part of whatever this airbox is, this coolant reservoir, the valve cover, and a handful of other things. Even with all of that out of the way, it was still easier to come in from the bottom. Easier, not easy. Interestingly, this frame has lots of dried goo that looks kind of like black RTV. I don't know if this is structural or just there to seal up the edges, but my welding patch wasn't so great, so I sealed it up by slathering it with high temp RTV. This is right next to the header, so I hope it is high temp enough. The suspension is nearly complete. I actually said the front suspension was done several months ago, which wasn't exactly true. Then I said it was done a few weeks ago, which also wasn't exactly true, but it is actually true now. All I had to do was weld in these brackets for the droop limiting straps. These straps are there to protect the shocks in aggressive off-road driving. I didn't add any adjustability to these, mostly because there wasn't much packaging space for it. I did add a little bit of adjustability. There are two holes in the bottom bracket, but with the 11-inch straps, it didn't actually limit the droop. It just stretched out the straps. So I swapped them out for some 10-inch straps, which worked great. I did add some adjustability to the rear straps. The bottom mounts are some laser-cut brackets that are welded together and bolted into the old bump stop perch. The tops are attached where the rear shocks originally mounted to the frame. I ran a bolt through here with some spacers and a bracket in between. The bracket in between, actually two laser-cut stainless parts, have mounting holes in three places for the strap and four places for the top mount. They have different spacing, so I can get several combinations of length adjustments. The brackets ended up being on the shortest setting, which means I underestimated the stretch of the rear straps as well. To use the shortest setting, I had to chop off the ends of the brackets, but it works good like this. Good enough. Perhaps the most important thing you can do before you drive your car for the first time, or the first time in a while, is to make sure you can stop. The car has brakes, they've been installed for a while. The fronts are real close to the wheel, like a millimeter away. I might add a wheel spacer to help this, or maybe I'll just let the metal on metal work itself out. Either way, I'm not doing it today. Today, I am bleeding the brakes. I have one of those power bleeders, which is definitely worth your money. You just fill it with brake fluid, screw the cap on, pump up the pressure, and then you crack open the bleeder screw of each caliper starting farthest from the reservoir. Unfortunately, there are a dozen different brake reservoir caps, and the one on the Viper is not the one I have. Had I thought about it, I probably could have 3D printed an adapter, but at the time I thought, why not just tap the cap and add a barbed fitting? Well, because the cap has a path for air to enter and escape, so you can't actually pressurize it. Then I thought, why don't I tap a piece of steel and zip tie it down with some rubber in between? And it worked. Kind of. It did what it was supposed to do and squeezed fluid out to the corners. It also squeezed it all over the left header and the floor, so that was fun. I finished the parking brake a while ago, but one of the ends came off. I don't know why, but I had to redo it. I was a little more careful this time, and I added a set screw in the side that probably won't help much, but it is there. While we were filling up the brake fluid, we filled all the other fluids. I had to drain the coolant to get the front cross brace out so I could finish up the front suspension. There is this coolant overflow that went behind the fascia, but we kind of modified that, so I'll need to get it back in there at some point. Whenever the engine gets too hot, it spits coolant into this bottle, and then it kind of sucks it back into the cooling loop when it cools down. I also need to clean it, but this is for another day. Today is for washer fluid. Not because it's needed, just because it's easy. I did fill up the transmission fluid I spilled out, and I also tried to fill up the rear end with some gear oil that Motul was nice enough to send, but it already had fluid in it. 
Either I filled it earlier and forgot, or it came from Jeep with fluid. Either way, problem solved. In theory, the engine should just start right up since I haven't actually done anything to it. All the changes have been suspension, frame, and body. So we should be able to just put the key in and... And... It would occasionally kick, but wouldn't actually start. I did notice a persistent clicking noise with the key in the on position, which we narrowed down to the auto shutdown relay under the hood. There was also another relay clicking in the trunk, but it was blocked by the battery. We swapped out the relay in the front for another one with no luck. I had done some welding on this car and most of it was with the connector for the engine control unit unplugged, but I did do a few things after I plugged it back in. So I was starting to think that I might have fried the ECU. I plugged in the OBD2 reader to see if it could find the ECU, but no luck. Uh oh. I did some googling and this clicking relay seemed like a problem that was common enough that it might be something easier. It's commonly caused by a bad battery or a poor electrical connection, but since the starter was cranking good, we ruled that out. Then I remembered something. There was a connector in the rear of the car that went to the battery and I was pretty sure it was powering the amplifier that the previous owner had put in, so I didn't connect it. So to test it out, I wired up a quick pigtail and had my massively overqualified intern Dave hold it onto the battery while I tried it. <laughs> In hunting down this issue, we did test the fuel pressure using the test port on the intake. In cycling the Schrader valve for probably the first time in 24 years, it got stuck open and was leaking everywhere, so I had to fix that. I just bought a new one. The engine was running and everything was good, unless you ask one of my neighbors who would tell you that everything was very loud, because I did not put the muffler on. The first Vipers had side exhaust right where you put your legs when you get out of the car. By the time my car came around, they moved the exhaust outlet to the rear, but the mufflers and catalytic converters are still in the side. And if you ask anyone ever, the correct exhaust outlet location for a Viper is on the side, so we're going to dump it out right here. I also ditched the original rocker covers because I'm going to make my own using the magic of Send Cut Send. They will be metal and double as rock sliders, and also double as incredibly hot leg burning devices, unless I mitigate that somehow. So we decided to wrap the cats and mufflers in some fiberglass heat shield, shiny blankets of fiberglass and aluminum to keep the exhaust warm and the outside not so warm. Unfortunately, the header outlet that these slip onto is not pointed in the proper direction. It is pointed this way when it needs to be pointed this way. This is because I dropped the rear of the transmission to point it at the axle, so the whole powertrain is angled like this. We already talked about this. Try to keep up. There is a three bolt flange on the outlet, so I fixed this problem by just ovaling out those holes. I did this using that end mill chucked up into a drill that I used last week on the front bumper. It did the job, but at what cost? The cost of one end mill. I welded on some exhaust turnouts, though I might change these. But either way, we needed to support the back of the exhaust somehow, so we tripled up some stainless steel tie wire and looped it around some holes in the frame. Not a permanent solution, but for now, it is good enough. I bolted up the transmission since I forgot to do that until moments ago. We also swapped in the new shifter and a new shift knob. One of the fans of the channel makes custom shift knobs and asked me if I wanted one for the Viper, and obviously I did. Excellent work with walnut, red accents, and the shift pattern on the top. I've got the link in the description if you want to get your own custom shift knob. He has several completely unique designs, and the work is excellent. Unfortunately, it will need to sit out the first drive, not because of it, but because of the new shifter I bought that it threads onto. It didn't feel right, and not only because we hadn't yet cut it to length. We couldn't figure out why, so for the time being, we just swapped back in the stock shifter. And that's it. That's all there is left to do, except drive the car. Just a few minutes before we finished getting the car ready, it started to rain, but that would not stop the Viper. It was time to drive. All right, maiden voyage. That's either sixth or reverse. The wet pavement combined with the 8 liter engine did cause the back tires to slide a bit, both on acceleration and compression braking. <laughs> the rear is open, it doesn't have a limited slip like the old rear. It does have a locker, but I have not wired that up yet. So 8 liters through one skinny off-road tire on wet pavement is a little slippery. But overall, the car did great. We did a real short drive, just literally around the block. Everything worked the way it was supposed to. The steering turned, the brakes braked, the wipers wiped, and the engine made lovely noises. And best of all, it looks so ridiculous. 
It looks like someone drew a cartoon and then made a Hot Wheels of that cartoon and then made a real version of that cartoon Hot Wheels car. I love it. I absolutely love it. It still needs side covers, a rear bumper, and several other small things, but it is a beautiful car. We did forget one important thing. We forgot to put the license plate on, so don't tell the police. It works! It works! <laughs> After it cleared up, I started fixing some things, like those intake tubes that weren't attached to the intake. I also dug into that new shifter. I thought maybe the springs were too strong, so I did some surgery and swapped in softer springs. I cut down that absurd extension I had to get it at the right height. I also need to get the center console back in with the gasket that helps keep incredibly hot air from blasting up through this hole. I also noticed that the spacers I was using on the new shifter were a little too thick. I had lengthened the bottom of the shifter to make up for the fact that I had lengthened the top since I dropped the transmission to line up with the... Uh, you know, I feel like we already talked about this. But measuring the old shifter again made me realize the spacers were a little too tall, so I put it back together with the correct spacers, and it works great now. I took it around the block again, this time the bigger block. I got some gas and enjoyed a brief drive along the beachfront. I took it out again at sunset to get some beauty shots. I was on the wrong side of the road, thinking I could get away with it for a minute, and then the police showed up. Ten minutes of driving this car and I've already been stopped by the police. And then he spent 20 minutes telling me how cool my car was. He was a subscriber. I love this car. Fortunately, I did remember to put my license plate on for that drive. I really need to get actual exhaust hangers. I've got the parts for those. I just need to install them. And I need to put that coolant bottle in. But it is a drivable car. I'm really itching to get the side covers made and on and the rear bumper. But overall, I'm pretty stoked on this car right now. If all goes well, I will take the car out to a couple of car meets over the next couple of weeks. If you want to know which ones, follow me on Instagram or join the Discord. I'll post in both of those places. Either way, thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe or you will go to jail.